Dr. Sunny Fridge. Welcome to another edition of Rise and Shine with Dr. Sunny. Season two is dedicated to helping you unleash your inner speaking superpowers. Each week you get tips, tools, and techniques to become a better communicator. On this edition of Rise and Shine, how to rewrite the story you tell. It has to do with your personality. If you're watching on YouTube or Facebook, share in the comments below where you're watching from. And if you're listening by podcast, please subscribe so you never miss a show. I believe we all have a purpose and the potential to live our best life, but sometimes roadblocks and limitations get in our way. My guest says the way to transcend your limitations and become the person you always wanted to be is to rewrite your self-limiting story. Dr. Benjamin Hardy is an organizational psychologist and best-selling author of Willpower Doesn't Work. His blogs have been read by over 100 million people and are featured on Forbes, Fortune, and CNBC, just to name a few. His latest book is titled, Personality Isn't Permanent. Welcome, Dr. Hardy. How are you? I'm so happy to be with you. Now, tell us just a little bit about yourself. I know there's a lot to tell. I've um, been studying psychology for the last 10 or so years. Um, my wife and I adopted three kids from the foster system back in 2018. And hilariously, my wife got pregnant a month after we adopted our kids. We had twins. And so now we have five kids. And uh, yeah, so I, I've had a lot of crazy experiences that led me to kind of being interested in what I've been interested in. I, I ended up I had a lot of traumatic experiences growing up, as many people have, and, and then I ended up serving a, a church mission, which allowed me to see how much people can transform and change their lives. And so that's really what led me to kind of studying psychology and hopefully helping other people to learn how they can change their lives, because I watched it happen for myself in a dramatic fashion. Your latest book is called Personality Isn't Permanent. What was the inspiration behind it? A few things inspired me to write this book. First off, when I was when I was in my PhD program, I learned a lot about personality and about kind of what shapes personality, about how personality works. And it was totally different from what most people think. <laughs> you know, most people in the general population kind of think personality is kind of one way. And kind of what I learned in the research was it's totally different and that it's not it's not how most people view it. And I thought that was really interesting. And also one of the things that I learned is that tests like Myers-Briggs, Enneagram, like basically type-based personality tests are non-scientific. They're non-valid, non-reliable. They're bad science. Uh, and I thought that was so interesting because those tests are so popular. And and, uh, and so I just thought that was really interesting. But the, the thing that really pushed me over the edge to write this book was reading Bessel van der Kolk's book, The Body Keeps the Score. I don't know if you've ever read that one, The Body Keeps the Score. No, I'll Google it. What a, what a book. It's basically the, like the most kind of authoritative book on the subject of trauma at this point. But basically what he talked about is, is that trauma is one of the core things that shapes people's personality. You know, negative traumatic experiences, um, big and small. And trauma basically creates what's called a frozen personality where you're stuck in the past. And I thought that was so interesting because it's true. Basically what trauma does is it shatters your flexibility as a person. It leads you to being very, very rigid in how you see yourself and what you're willing to do. And it, it shatters your hope and your imagination, which are required for goal setting and for learning. And so I just thought I needed to write a book that explained to people what personality actually is, how it works, um, and how you can change it and that it does change. And so that was why I wrote the book. And I love your talk about the future self. That is like so much what we as speakers when we don't have the confidence and we know we want to be better and we're always striving to be our best version of ourselves and you say in your book that you should never be the former anything um what did you mean by that yeah this is good stuff so whether you're successful or whether you're a failure whether you whether your former self was a drug addict living on the streets or whether your former self was an olympic athlete uh, you shouldn't be the former anything you shouldn't be stuck in a former identity or a former narrative um, because if you're stuck in a persona or stuck in the past, then you're living subconsciously. You're not, you're basically just going through the motions. Um, instead, you should kind of base who you are on your future self, on the person you want to be. Um, and there's a lot of good research behind that. So there's a TED Talk, for example, but this is based on real research, not just a TED Talk. But the TED Talk's from um, Daniel Gilbert. He's at Harvard. He's a psychologist. And the talk's called The Psychology of Your Future Self. And he explains how personality changes and develops over time. There's also research from a guy named Hal Hirschfeld at UCLA, and he studied 
decision making and about how when you have a future self in mind, it allows you to make decisions here and now that are better. Um, and so I'll kind of explain this. Mm -hmm. Basically, I'll just ask you real quick, Dr. Sunny. Are you the exact same person you were 10 years ago? I am not. You know, you're, you're not I, the exact I, same person. I'm not even ex the exact same person I was when I went to bed last night. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. I couldn't agree more. I, I think that that's totally true. And so it's really good and healthy to realize that you're not the same person you used to be, but it's also good to realize that your future self is not who you are right now. They're going to be totally different. They're going to have different perspectives, different views, different priorities, different goals, and they're going to have different preferences. They're going to want to use their time differently. And so first off, that's important because it allows you to say, well, who is my future self? And what they say is that the number one deathbed regret that most people have is that, is that they didn't have the courage to be who they wanted to be, but instead they lived up to the expectations of other people. Right. And so the first question you have to ask yourself is, who do I want to be? Who do I genuinely want to be? Mm -hmm. If I could be, and if I wasn't worried about the consequences socially, or if I wasn't afraid, or if I, you know, because we all lack the confidence to be who we want to be. And so you have to be courageous. Um, and so who do you really want to be? You have to define that, but then you have to start telling everyone who you genuinely want to be. If you start telling everyone that, then that becomes your new identity story, your new narrative. It's based on who you want to be, not on who you've been. And why this is so important is because when you know that your future self is not who you currently are, but now you're striving for it and you're telling people about it, then you can hold a little bit more loosely your current identity. You don't have to, like, you don't have to overly own your current self because your current self is temporary. But a lot of people, they're like, I know who I am. This is exactly who I am. This is who I always will be. It's like, no, you don't have to do that because your current self is temporary. Um, I love that sort of like a book that I read by Michelle Obama, Becoming. I love how she- Beautiful book. Out. And we're often always becoming who we were meant to be, who God chose us or wanted us to be our best self. Beautiful. I also- I wanted to know more. You say flip the script on negative memories and view them as something that happened for you, not to you. So this goes back to trauma. Whatever's happened to you, and a lot of bad things happen to all of us, things that are outside our control, sometimes things that were within our control. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they could be events that occurred. They could be just societal things. Um, but if you're still viewing the past as if it was something that is happening to you, Mm -hmm. you know, like something that is causing you to be the way you are, then you're blaming your current self on the past. And therefore your past is what's dictating who you are. If you view the past as something that happened for you, even if it was totally negative, the absolute, you know, terrible, if someone was, you know, abused you in some form or fashion or, or just something bad happened. If you can view that, that it was something that happened for you and it's something you can use to, and that your life's can be different because of that. Then, then your past is no longer the thing driving you. It's just positive information that you can use. I mean, obviously some of it was negative, but it's information you can use to make better decisions. And, and you know, just as an example, I'll use myself. You know, I grew up in a pretty traumatic episode. You know, my parents got divorced when I was 11. My father became an extreme drug addict. And for a long time, I viewed that event as something that was happening to me, that I was the victim to negative events. Um, but it's important to realize your memory is flexible. Your memory isn't just something that you have as like a filing cabinet. Like your memory is literally recreated every time you do it. Um, it's reimagined every time you, you create it. And so you get to choose kind of what you see and how you see it and how you frame it and how you describe it. And, and a lot of times that requires thinking about it, like in, even journaling about it, journaling about former experiences and writing about how they've impacted you, but also thinking about how is your life different because of that? You know, what, how would your future self view these experiences? Um, why is your life and future going to be better because of this experience? Like, why are you, you know, and even maybe getting other information, you know, for example, one of the things that I've done, and by the way, my dad's not a drug addict anymore. Um, that was right. a long time. That was a long time ago. Awesome. Um, yeah, he's totally evolved out of that and we're totally great friends. But one of the things that I did do that I never had done before was get more context. And that means that I, I asked him his perspective. What happened? You know, why did you end up going down that path, dad? What led you to that? Um, how did it feel? What was it like when, for example, me and my younger brothers abandoned him? Like just getting perspectives and, and hearing his take and realizing there was a lot more to it than my 11 year old's perspective. And also he's transformed his life, which is totally inspiring. Um, so it's just, you, you get to reframe the meaning of the past, just like you can reframe the meaning of current experiences. Uh, and it's just essential to realize that that's what you have to do if you, if you want to move forward in your life. You can't keep viewing it the same way. And so that goes in line with you, with you saying in your book that designing a desired 
vision of your future self and make the decisions that they would want, not really either on your past or even maybe who you are now. I mean, I think that's a big part of it, realizing you're not that same person, but also when it comes to your past, it's important to realize. So there's a quote from Stephen Covey. Stephen Covey said, we don't see the world as it is. We see the world as we are. And, and the same is true of our past. You don't see the past as it is. You see the past as you are. And when you evolve and you grow, you see the past hopefully more positively. Um, and so, this, so, that, so your future self is going to view the past differently than you see it now. Like I'll give an example. Um, I recently, so when you go through a lot of learning and development, obviously you change a lot, <laughs> you know? Right. Um, and over the last three years, I've gone through so much learning and training and mentoring as it comes to like being a writer. So like when I wrote Willpower Doesn't Work, which was my first major market book, that was three years ago. Uh, I recently reread the book long after, like seriously, it was like a month ago, I reread it and I realized, holy cow, I'm totally different than the person who wrote that book. Like I wouldn't have written that book today. I'm not saying I don't love it or don't believe in it. I just, there's some things maybe I don't agree with anymore. I'm not really sure but I don't see the world the exact same way as the person who wrote that book. Um, and so that, that's actually one of the things that stopped me from blogging in the first place, or maybe being a speaker. So for example, for your audience, there was a long time where I held off putting out my information because I was worried about it being correct. Um, and now I just realized that looking back on my old blogs, most of them I wouldn't write today. Not that I don't agree with, disagree with them. I just, I'm a different person now, a different thinker and a different writer, and I'm still glad I did it. And I don't judge my former self or my former writing. I can just look at it and say, wow, like interesting. It's interesting. And it actually is really powerful to watch your own growth and development that way. And, and how does it feel to have come from where you were to even where you are today? I, I imagine you must have imagined it in order to do this. You have to. The only way to actually make radical progress is... Um, I mean, you can change your personality and your life is going to change if you're not intentional, but if you're taking the time to actually define a future self and then to, on a daily basis, work towards that, which is to live consciously and proactively. Um, yeah, you can watch, you can, you can become who you want to be. I mean, that's a big aspect of this book. Like, so when I was back in 2015, Uh I was in my first year of my PhD program and I wanted to be a professional author. I wanted to write books for the big publishers. I wanted to, you know, make a good living and provide for my family. And that was my future self, you know? And so then you can set goals, you know, and then you can learn the process and you can go through what's called deliberate practice, which is, you know, Malcolm Gladwell calls it the 10,000 hour rule. It's not actually a rule because you can do something for 10,000 hours and not get any better. Now, I've seen people write thousands of blog posts and not really get anywhere. You have to actually have a vision and then use that vision to dictate your process. And then you have to be honest about your results. And you've got to transform your process to get the results you're looking for in order for it to be transformative. So when it comes to doing these things and measuring your progress, you say measure by how much you've grown rather than what you may still be lacking. Think about it. Like it's, so Dan Sullivan, who's the founder of Strategic Coach, he talks about measuring the gain, not the gap. Mm-hmm. So it's really powerful to look back on where you were even three, six months ago and be like, wow, look at how much has changed in the last six months. You know? and, and when you watch your progress and you can see change happening and that starts to really build your confidence that you can keep going and maybe you can make more and more change every three months. You know? And then you can keep measuring the gain and realize, holy cow, life keeps changing. I'm moving forward. It doesn't mean you don't have visions. You know, you've got that future self, but that thing's driving you. But then you look back and you measure the progress and you see, holy cow, things are changing a lot. It really boosts your excitement and your confidence. Now, your book has some fascinating true stories of people who have had self-transformation, some of them really radical. Just share a few, just for a little inspiration. Yeah, there's a lot of great stories. One of my favorites is from um, Andre Norman. Andre is a good friend of mine now, but he was in prison for 14 years. Um, So I'll kind of tell the story a little bit about Andre because it's so interesting, but it really explains how personality is shaped. So Andre grew up in the hood of Boston. Um, And essentially what happened was he actually had a really, he was lucky because he had a great, like I think sixth grade teacher who was a, a music teacher. And she helped Andre get into music and really wanted to invest in him. Like she, she supported him and wanted to make sure that he had a good future because she could see he, he was going down a bad path just given his environment, essentially, his peer group and his family and stuff. So anyways, when it was time for Andre to go to junior high school, she actually made the decision to help him go to a magnet school where her husband taught, where he could continue in band rather than going to the normal school. And 
so he ended up going to that magnet school and continued studying band. But he was also, he kind of had two personalities at the time because we all kind of do. And so he was still kind of surrounded by kind of the thugs, like the tough kids, you know. And he didn't really want, he loved band, but he didn't really like, he didn't really want to identify himself with the band kids because he considered them geeks or whatever. And so one day he was hanging out with his friends and they told him that he couldn't carry the stupid trumpet around with him. Like he was carrying like the black box, you know, the trumpet box. And they said, if you, you they said basically, you can't carry that stupid box around or, you know, around us anymore or else you can't be our friend. You got to get rid of that. And so what ultimately happened was, is when Andre, he, he did throw away the trumpet. And what happened was, is that when he, as he explains it, when he threw away his trumpet, he threw away his purpose because that was the only thing in his life that kind of gave him a reason to go to school. He had a vision for his future that was like, maybe he could play the trumpet. When he threw that away, he stopped having a purpose around the trumpet. And so he actually had no reason to go to school. Like that was the only reason he was going to school. His purpose shifted from his trumpet to being kind of like really like the kind of uh, to fit in with his friends. And so whatever your purpose is, that's actually the thing shaping your personality. Like he may have not been that explicit about it because he was a kid, but whatever it is you're currently pursuing, that's the thing driving your attention and your personality. So like his goal became to fit in with his friends. And what that ended up leading him to doing was becoming like a criminal. He ended up landing in jail and then his goal ended up becoming to be the number one thug in prison. And so like that led him to almost killing several people in prison. And eventually he got to some point where he was in solitary confinement. And, um, you know, he realized at some point or another that his goal was to literally be the number one guy in prison. And, and it dawned on him that that, that was not a very good goal. <laughs> like it dawned on him that that was a pretty lame goal. And that once he actually got there, which he was close to getting there, he would be nowhere. He actually called it his Wizard of Oz moment, where yeah. he realized that at the end of the Wizard of Oz, like at the end of the Yellow Brick Road, it's all smoke and mirrors. He said, there's nothing there. You know, and so he realized that he was pursuing a stupid goal, but that goal was literally the thing shaping everything he was doing. It was his identity. And your identity is literally is based on your goals. And so then he changed his goal. You know, he realized that he wanted to get out of prison. He wanted to start over. He wanted to actually go somewhere worth going. And so and it's really important to realize that you choose this thing. You don't find it. You don't find your personality. You choose it. Um, you choose your goal. You choose your purpose. And so he ultimately decided, I want to go to Harvard. Um, that was the only college you'd ever heard of because he was from the hood of Boston. Like that was literally the only college you'd ever heard of. <laughs> uh, bad, not a bad choice. <laughs> not a bad choice. <laughs> so, so tell us, you can't leave us hanging. Did he make it? Yeah, he did. So it took him, I think it took him an additional six or eight years to get out of prison. But because that became his purpose and his goal, he ended up learning how to read while he was in prison. He got mentoring. He met with a rabbi who helped him kind of like forgive himself and other people. Like he learned law, like when your goal shapes your process, you know, and his goal or his purpose shaped his personality. So he ended up becoming like really on good behavior. He avoided all the like the losers in prison and he really got himself on a path because of his purpose, which shaped his personality. And so ultimately, he ended up getting out of prison, became a spokesperson for how to change your life. And he ended up becoming a fellow at Harvard. And he had his own office there and even lectured at Harvard. And he's an amazing guy. So like he's, he's, a, he's a really good example of someone that doesn't really matter what your past was, your purpose or your goal is the thing shaping who you are. And you can and should judge your current goals and say, is this something that's worth my time? Because this is taking me somewhere and it's shaping who I'm becoming. And you can choose your goal. You can choose your purpose. And that's the thing that's going to determine who you become. I've heard so many great things here, Cho choosing your choice, the choices you make, as I've often heard, the choices you make, make you, and confidence is such an important part of that. So as we wrap, for those speakers, for those entrepreneurs who really do want to rewrite their story, including myself, just to be more confident. And myself. Okay. <laughs> any other pieces of advice about um making that happen. I, I know you wrote a recent blog even about how you end your day, how you go to sleep and wake up in the morning. It's like that's a, that part of your evening routine is pretty important, having some thoughts on your mind for your next morning even. Yeah, so I would say you have to start with your identity because without having a clear future self, you actually don't know who you currently are. If you don't know who you want to be, then who, who cares who you are today? Mm -hmm. And so without a future self, you have no current self, honestly, or at least no clear current self. So you need to define your future identity mm -hmm. and then you need to start telling everyone about that person. You need to start telling everyone that this is who you're striving to be with a recognition that you're not that person yet. 
but you're striving and you're trying to be that person and that's who you're planning to be and who you're planning to become. That takes courage. Mm -hmm. um, that really clarifies your identity, but it also clarifies your environment. Um, when you start telling everyone about your goals, then it becomes clear who's encouraging you and who's not. It also clarifies who you need to be surrounded by because they're the ones who are going to help you get there. That inner um, circle. Yeah, you should surround yourself with people who are, are reflective of your future self, not your former self. Um, and, you know, aside from that, journaling and journaling every single day is crucial. You know, if you want to live on purpose every single day, you need to give yourself space in the morning before you start looking at your smartphone and stuff to actually visualize your future self and think about who you need to be today to be conscious. You need to be, you can't just, you can't just be conscious all the time. You have to actually think about it. That's what being conscious is about. So for example, like after this podcast, I'm going to go home and I'm going to be with my five kids. I could easily just fall into the role or the habits that I have and just maybe go home and not be that, that great for my kids. But if I want to like be really epic and like be a good father, I need to be like, okay, who do I need to be this today in order for my kids to have an amazing experience? So you have to actually be thoughtful about what you need to do and who you need to be today. And that's, that's where journaling comes in every single day. You can write about your goals, write about what you need to accomplish today, write about or think about, you know, this is just like, who, how do you want to show up like at work or like with your, with your spouse or like with your kids or like on this podcast, like, how do you want to show up? Yes. Uh, it really allows you to be conscious and really make progress towards your future self. And so journaling every single morning and having a morning routine and then making progress towards your goals is how you build confidence. And so you can do that every day. Little bits of progress allow you to become more flexible and less constrained by the past and allow you to then move forward in your future. Awesome. High five. High five on that. <laughs> that is great. Um, and especially young people, as I even think about that, they're always, hey, what do you want to be when you grow up? They're really thinking about their future self. And we can still continue as adults to think about that future self. So There should I, never be a time when you stop having a future self. Wow. wow. Never. There should never be a time. If you've stopped having a future self, then you are literally on autopilot and you're, you're on your way to the deathbed. Dr. Hardy, how can people get more information about your book? I know it's due out in June. Yep, June 16th. So you can get the book anywhere, uh, Audible, Amazon. You can find more about it on BenjaminHardy.com. There's a lot of free resources on BenjaminHardy.com. So I hope you enjoy the book. It will shock your system in a good way and help you to become the person you want to be. Really awesome. excited to be here. Thank you, Dr. Sunny. It was fun. Dr. Benjamin Hardy, thanks for your time and stay safe. Thank you. You too. And that's all the time we have on this edition of Rise and Shine with Dr. Sunny. Again, thank you to my guest, Dr. Benjamin Hardy, for sharing personality isn't permanent. I continue to be blessed by your texts, your emails, and comments on social media to let me know you've been inspired by the stories of my guests and tips to become a more confident speaker. If you enjoy our programs, if you haven't done so already, please consider making a donation of any amount at WYTV7.org to help our CBN broadcasters continue the mission to bring you programming that educates, empowers, and encourages. And you can find all my shows and podcasts online at WYTV7.org forward slash rise dash shine. And please like my Facebook page at facebook.com, I rise and shine. And as you continue to stay safe in the coming weeks, keep the faith and Make the choice to do something today that your future self will thank you for. God bless you. I'm Dr. Sunny. Remember, it's your time to rise and shine.